Well, thank you very much, uh, John, and Professor, thank you for your kindly words on, uh, uh, on uh, the occasion that we've got here tonight, which is a very big one for the Institute, and Sue, lovely to see you here too. Sue did inflict on me the only personal loss I've ever experienced <laughs> outside the Labor Party's pre-selection system. <laughs> And uh, it's just lovely to stand here and see so many old friends. And I'm so grateful that you turned out tonight. Mary O'Hara, she's uh, been a wonderful donor for the Institute over the years. And, uh, and many people, some I've talked with, uh, some I've done politics with. Uh, particularly glad to see my friend Steve Smith made it out tonight. And uh, that's, uh, he was a, a marvellous boss at one point in time. In fact, Steve got me the appointment, uh, not other people. But uh, nevertheless, it's a... Um, it, it, and Carol Bolton, uh, thank you for coming. It's, uh, your, your husband was a... Your late husband was a seminal influence on a lot of us who were students here uh, at that time. Um, and, and let me also, too, acknowledge the elders and the people on whose land we are meeting. Well, three score years and ten, that's all the Bible gives us. And uh, so the Institute here in Western Australia has done very well to uh, reach this point. The Institute, both here and nationally, though its fortunes have waxed and waned, has, through the work of its leaders, committees, state and national, built a substantial record of encouraging serious thought about the terms and conditions of our national survival. Though we have eschewed rigorously the idea of an institute line, we have provided a forum for foreign policy and security policy through leadership. We have been sensitive to the changing character of the need for us. For a time at the outset, when Fred was founding the branch here, with no serious academic study of our foreign relations, we were the focal point in providing the providing of fora for research, publication and exposition of often unique Australian thinking on the character of global politics, our region, our alliances, our relations in an era of extraordinary hazard before World War II. We've receded as authoritative institutions have developed around us, particularly in the academy, but in a way that has turned us into valuable enablers in part by providing fora, support for research, publication outlets. We are still a must-go-to point for the political leadership of our country when they seek a platform that they know will be attended to. I've done this myself. Now, when I was Defence Minister, I received an invitation in 1987 to deliver the Roy Milne Lecture. That's the Premier Lecture that the uh, Institute offers every year. As Minister, I addressed uh, the Institute three times, including here. The Milne Lecture was thinking defence, key concepts in Australian defence planning. It was probably the most serious lecture that I actually gave in my six years as a defence minister. I did it because I was disturbed by the, uh, the theology of defence thinking uh, in the, in the internal in the bureaucracy. So uh, I, I went through the way in which they thought was a message to them. I think the audience was mildly mystified, but we were going through the process of discussing how you define threats, how you find warning times, how you fit alliances into all of that, how you plan a force structure on the basis of it. The dear souls who were in front of me found this a little a bit thunderous, uh, but, uh, but also I think they understood that I was trying to do something serious. For this lecture, there is an irony in one aspect of the title. I'm going to talk of my own experience working Washington. The founder of our branch preceded me and produced the first public articulation of working Washington from an Australian point of view. His small publication, Australia and the US, is a must read for those who want to know something of the creation of our wartime alliance. Published in 1941, it was a product of his experiences in 1940, studying there and then joining the staff of our first ambassador, R.G. Casey.
Fred had been encouraged to go to the US by Menzies, and Casey seized on his expertise, and he was temporarily one of only two or three of whom we would now call political officers. Uh, Casey had three political officers, effectively, a few defence personnel, and what was said to be lots of secretaries, which is a breed that has largely departed the department, and lots of secretaries, but when I contemplate the fact that there were nearly 300 people working in 16 agencies for me at the, uh, at the embassy, it shows how extraordinarily different uh, things are now. And it was a product, this book, of his experiences. He was quickly, very deeply connected in Washington. A similar experience to myself. They will talk to Australians. He traces the vicissitudes of clashing, heavily supported views in the American decision-making processes, swinging in that year, year wildly between a preference for retreat and appeasement in the Pacific to back a full-throttle effort in the Atlantic to a willingness by the end of the year to plan for eventualities in the Pacific, even if those plans were, uh, as subsequent history proved, a, a little miscast in the way which was done. The swing thing, the thing that caused them to swing from one position to the other, in Fred's view, it was largely Churchill's decision in mid-1940 to blast the French fleet in the Mediterranean and in North Africa, a thing which broke Fred, it broke, uh, broke, it didn't break Fred's heart, broke Churchill's heart, but it, it riveted the United States and established in the minds of the Americans that the Royal Navy would predominate no matter what happened on land and therefore they could swing their attention uh, back to the Pacific. He was alert to a lack of American awareness of Australian perspectives and growing capabilities as he was alert to nuance in American priorities. His view that we had something to learn but also something to offer to me is still the correct stance on working Washington. Having described the swing in US opinion toward a strategic stand in the Pacific, he said, as a result, the quickened, in quickened interest of Australians in American policy in the Pacific was accompanied by a readiness for the greatest possible degree of political and strategic cooperation with the United States, with a nation whose resources were admittedly far greater than those of Australia and whose active friendship was therefore not only to be welcomed but even to be sought. But in seeking to transform an existing friendly relationship into one of elective, uh, active collaborations, Australians did not feel that they approached their friends cap in hand, bearing with them instead something to place in the common pool. By the end of 1940, he, the Australian, was conscious of a considerable wartime achievement and, if anything, was overconfident rather than defeatist in considering his future ability to contribute to his own defence. I would sum it up more contemporarily by saying we still have much to contribute, sufficient for us to alert our friends when our interests clash and our opinions differ, contemplating always that one of our interests is their success and their security. Now, working Washington is complex because there are a myriad decision points in Washington. And the right one for your purpose, any particular purpose, has to be found, informed and nurtured. Simple in that Americans appreciate straightforwardness and we don't have a reputation for precious subtlety or deceit. <laughs> Americans uh, don't do irony all that well. We do know that uh, from their humour. But they also assume that people speak the truth. And uh, if you disappoint them in that regard, you virtually get nothing across ever. But if you sustain that reputation, even if it's a hard truth, you're always appreciated. What we do have to remember, what an ambassador has to remember, is how burdensome life is for most American decision makers, appreciating always that they can do without mindless hectoring or bland lack of, effort, uh, of empathy. Well, there's more on that later. Well, here are essential approaches to working Washington. The 
First is, have a clear-eyed picture of the shifting uh, relationship, of the shifting power equation through time and the point that we have now reached. That's a very important thing to convey them. You know your significance and their significance and the significance of your interaction. Here, the point is a great paradox. We have a closer relationship with the United States now than we did in the Cold War. We need them now more than we did then. They still need us, but the relativities have changed. I became very conscious of how deeply embedded we were in the national security structure and how large the weapons program that we managed. I was shocked. I had no idea, and we had not been in the days when I was Defence Minister, so deeply embedded at all levels of the complex American intelligence community. I had not been aware of how intensely engaged the Embassy was with the, uh, uh, the arms program that uh, was effectively rearming or arming the Australian armed forces. We were managing at the Embassy over 400 foreign military sales projects. We were spending in the United States $13 million a working day. And uh, the Austra Australia turns out always in the top six or seven American customers of their arms industry, and we are one, and not all of those who are in the top six or seven pay for it in the way in which we do. I tried to get an understanding of this. Why was this so? I think it went this way. We found in the 1960s, 70s and 80s, when we built the relationship with the United States, that the essence of it lay around, frankly, the joint facilities. And the joint facilities were so absolutely vital to the United States that they were prepared to see or hear from us a great deal of disagreement and dissension about the direction of policy. So we could find a, at the time when the United States is putting cruise missiles into Britain, Pershing missiles into Germany, um, confronting the Kiwis over whether or not you'd have port visits and the like, when Bob Hawke decided he didn't want to provide a minor degree of assistance to a test of an MX missile, they copped it. They copped it, but they would not have copped it from anyone else. When I decided that uh, pridefully, because I was a very junior defence minister in terms of age, that um, the strategic defence initiative proposed by Ronald Reagan was destabilising, I uh, argued in Cabinet successfully for the point of view that we ought not to participate in the SDI process. The issue was uh, raised, of course, well, you've got these facilities. Aren't they automatically engaged in research? Well, knowledge is indivisible. Obviously, in knowledge and information that you have from any of the facilities that you have uh, must uh, be able to inform anything else you're doing. But that is passive. The question of active engagement in the research we set to one side. The Liberal Party opposed that proposition, but when Cap Weinberg and the Secretary of Defence came out here, I, was, I found extraordinary a speech that he gave at the Australian Press Club, when there were no less than, I think, 16 questions designed to put him at variance with me. He did not move an inch. He did not in any way, shape or form, seek to see the Australian government embarrassed, or opponents which agreed with their position enhanced. And both of those instances, were, and, and also he was prepared to let us say that the joint facilities were not being actively used in research projects, even though that went beyond the agreed discussion of the purposes of the facilities at the time. That gives you an indication of how vital they were to the United States. We were the only ally of the United States 
who did not consume American security, but had American security, uh, our security, consumed by the United States. If those facilities had not been there, we would not have been a nuclear target. The fact that those facilities were there meant we were a nuclear target. Everybody else triggered that great American preparedness to sacrifice after World War II when they could have chosen isolation. They chose themselves to hold themselves hostage because a general exchange with the Soviet Union would have killed 140 million Americans and there'd be no United States on the basis of that exchange. They prepared themselves to hold themselves hostage to good behaviour in Europe and good behaviour in North Asia. And nobody would have suggested the historical record to that point when that good behaviour was likely in either of those places. So it was an extraordinary thing, but it was vital to them. It was the case in that day that uh, the uh, distant early warning system radars operated in Canada, in Britain, that warned of a uh, track and warned of a Soviet strike, gave an American president 15 minutes warning. And that football that the, uh, the president carries around with him can launch an attack on 15 minutes warning. This is tense in that uh, set of circumstances. So when the Aurora Borealis would occasionally show up as a Soviet missile strike, that uh, could be a crisis creating event. But it wasn't, because the facility at Narunga provided 30 minutes warning. And uh, so there could be correction. But if an attack had been launched, the person who would have told the command centre, then the president, in the first instance, would have been a, an Australian Air Force squadron leader in command of the shift at Narunga at, uh, at that point of time. So it was vital for them. And they put up with a lot from us. South Pacific nuclear free zones, chemical weapons treaties, uh, movement towards a Cambodian settlement that was deeply opposed by the Chinese and therefore by the Americans. A whole range of these initiatives. They put up for that for two reasons. Firstly, the reasons I've been talking about. And secondly, the fact that in Southeast Asia, post the Vietnam War, post the Victory Doctrine, was a strategic backwater for the United States. Nothing really that went on there substantially impinged on the distribution of the power, the advantage or disadvantage of the United States. So provided we were holding firm on those joint facilities. The United States pretty well gave us a leave past, largely, on a point of indifference. Well, what's changed? Oh, we did get, of course, certain things. We got good equipment, we got good intelligence and the like. And we had a reserve presence. Anyone who thought about doing an attack on Australia might have to contemplate taking on the United States as well, which is an altogether different problem. And, uh, that, uh, and, and that was there, but there was nobody actually around the place who was proposing to do any of that. What has changed now? What is the difference between that situation then and now? Well, it's essentially this. Those facilities are still important, but we're off the target list. People, the Russians, Americans, they've stood down the active targeting of their nuclear forces. And for countries like China, which operate on minimal deterrence, anything directed towards Australia would be a waste of a weapon. So that level of danger has, has, has disappeared from us. So that contribution, if you like, to allowing our security to be consumed has gone. On the other hand, since that point of time, there has been a revolution in military affairs. American equipment is now vastly superior to any of the equipment that is offered by anyone else where they're choosing to compete in a particular area. And we have moved to a situation where, without it, we would simply not be able to sustain a technological edge in this region, and in this region there is an arms race. 
So the American kit, you can see it now in air, our air defence, which is both the most effective it's, it's ever been, uh, and uh, is in fact virtually entirely American. So we gain now vastly more in our security position than we did then. We have become important to them for a different reason. The facilities, as I said, are still important. But vastly more important is the area we inhabit. The pivot, the rebalance in American policy, which manifests itself in the time I was there, as one of the tasks I had to manage it from the Australian <coughs> end, is a Southeast Asian pivot. The United States has always regarded Affairs of China, of, uh, of uh, Japan, of Korea, Taiwan, as vital and central, and they were central to the Cold War struggle. Southeast Asia was not. The pivot is about Southeast Asia because the totality of Asia is now the focal point of the global economy, and that will only be that will only develop more intensively uh, as, as time goes by. So instead of being in a strategic backwater but doing useful things, we are now the southern tier. We're the southern tier of, from the American point of view, the, uh, the most important part of the, uh, the global distribution of power. Now the second point, that's the first thing, is to understand that and explain that to America. You, uh, because they don't, they've got a lot to think about. But you have to be able to articulate that perspective or you're basically useless to the country. The second point to work in Washington is to have a very clear understanding of appreciation of the burdens of US leadership. I'm always amazed at not what Americans shy away from, and it's always an issue in American politics as to whether or not they ought to disengage from their very forward-leaning postures. But when that view seems salient, and a preference for lowering international connection is, seems to be triumphant, it can be counterbalanced in 24 hours by a threat to someone's freedom with whom the Americans empathise. I always found in conversations with Americans Reference to American preparedness to render themselves Cold War hostages, as I talked about a little bit earlier, a fact they appreciate but feel no one else understands. They are overwhelmed. I remember doing a discussion uh, at a celebration we had, a commemoration we had of the Battle of the Coral Sea, and the admirals were weeping. That anyone could think to say that of them in an appreciative way, it meant a lot to them. In the pit of the stomach of an American national security decision maker, most particularly the president, is a cold, hard lump of fear. The knowledge that what you've taken on yourselves, and what your country has taken on, is capable of producing really quite extreme results. You want to know why a president's hair turns grey? And Obama is an extraordinary case when you, when you take a look at that. On his desk every morning, there's a telephone book of threats to the United States. It is a new book every day. And it is detected attacks on cyber attacks, of course, coming thousands every day. But uh, in, uh, in terms of identified intelligence services identifying a threat to an American overseas interest or, uh, or, or personnel or domestically, the President has to confront that every morning uh, when he wakes up. And all of them share his, uh, who work for him, share his concerns. I, I looked after many visits by, uh, uh, by Prime Ministers to the United States when I was there. And they were all good, and our, our folk did very well. Uh, but um, the one sentence that sticks in my mind was Tony Abbott, which might surprise you. I, we prepared intensively for, for, for uh, 
Prime Minister Abbott's visit, we were quite aware that, they were, that Tony Abbott and the prevailing American administration were simply poles apart on the, the raft of social issues, of economic directions and the like. It was a bit of an effort to sit down and work out to advise the Prime Minister on how he might just sort of nuance a bit on climate change or something like that <laughs> in the conversations that he had with his and none of it, I might say. And anyway, um, Obama started off with the, uh, the, the usual... You always know you're in a bit of trouble when you get the whole responsory out there for the meeting with the Prime Minister. So you don't just get the Prime Minister as National Security Advisor, maybe Secretary of State. You get the Vice President, the Trade Spokesperson, the uh, Head of the Intelligence Community. You've got a whole raft of them lined up there in the Oval Office, which doesn't take many, I can tell you. And uh, to, to back the President's uh, discussion in. And Adam got up and he said, well, Barrett, um, <laughs> he called him Tony, and, well, Barack, uh, most people come here with a, a to-do list, things they want from you or points that they want to make from you. I really don't have any points uh, to make. We'll have a discussion, obviously. But I just want to say this. We think you're about to get into real trouble in the Middle East, and I just want you to know that we will be with you in numbers. <laughs> and uh, it was a... Uh, you know, and, and to my surprise, you get reports back over the next three months of Obama wandering around saying, we need more Tony Abbott. <laughs> <laughs> They're also hopelessly underpaid and hopelessly overworked. They work seven days a week, virtually 24 hours a day. They're available 24 hours a day. The weekend is marked by wearing jeans, not suits. And it was terrific. You could always invite one of them out. They like to escape and have a cigar with them on the porch at the, uh, at the residence to, uh, and you get a three or four hour chat when you were able to do that. Now, it is not necessarily the White House, no matter what George W. Bush once said that he was the decider. The truth is he's not. There's lots of deciders in the United States and lots of points where quite important things to you will be stopped at a place way up uh, than the President of the United States. I remember the first thing I had to do was to get the Defence Trade Cooperation Treaty. It was signed by Howard and George W. Bush that just lay dormant to get it through the Congress, to get it ratified. And everybody seemed to support it. The head of the department then, Senator Kerry, the head of the committee then, Senator Kerry, because that's the recommending committee, uh, the ranking member, Senator Lugar, Republican, in favour of it, the department was in favour of it, the, as the discussion proceeded, all the other departments with an interest in it eventually signed off on it, nothing happened. It took us months to find that there were two people on the Republican side of the Foreign Affairs Committee staff who, because of the character of it, had been taken from the approval process of a weapons sale, and they were upset that uh, this had happened. So we spent a lot of time with those two guys. We eventually got it out, got it into the, uh, the Senate for a vote, and um, a call came through. It wasn't going to be voted on. Uh, we made inquiries. There was one senator who says under Senate rules has this capacity. If a senate, senator objects to something being discussed, it isn't discussed. We didn't know who the senator was or why that objection was made. It was released by midday and the vote took place uh, that afternoon. We never did find out why that had happened. But uh, usually what it is, is the senator trying to bargain something else uh, onto the agenda. In the military area, the equipment programs, the things that we've been talking about, not presidents, it's functional in different parts of the Defence Department or the military that you get conclusions. And finally, there is always a different style on decision making. Obama has doubled the size of the National Security Council. He has subsumed more of the powers of the agencies, like State and Defence, than any other president has, historically. And most of them have subsumed them quite a bit 
but Obama has subsumed, subsumed them a hell of a lot. And it's run by the day-to-day -day foreign policy of the United States is run by an outfit called the Deputies Committee. The Deputies Committee is chaired out of the NSC, out of the White House, usually by one of the Deputy National Secretary Security Advisors. Uh, and that deputy will accumulate around him or her, uh, when I left it was a her, a uh, deputy secretaries of other departments, not actually usually, they're usually under secretaries for political affairs or line officers who are often assistant secretaries, but it's called the deputies committee euphemistically. These are actually the people who deal with ambassadors, which is an enormous advantage. Secretaries and presidents don't deal with ambassadors, except on the occasions of ministerial visits. But these, the deputies all do. And for a couple of years, I was enormously frustrated by the number of meetings that I'd have cancelled and uh, the people I was going to see. And I would complain about the fact that Australia was being ill-treated until I discovered it was everybody's experience. And uh, the, um, uh, the point was, and once you knew this, they meet once a day, but often they'll meet five or six times a day. So when there's a crisis of any description proceeding, they'll be shuttling to and fro from the agencies to the deputies committee. And of course, in the crises, those are the things that you really want to uh, have a, uh, some sort of cycle. So you learn pretty quickly that when you missed out on your 10 o'clock meeting in the morning, you'd let it run. And then try and get it about 4.30. If you got them, try to get them at 5.30, that's when they're going in to see the president. So you somehow have to get them in the hour between, uh, either on the phone, though that's never very useful for some of them, not most, but some are security conscious, but um, the, uh, if you're getting to see them in person, you will be in possession of a load of information, which comes to the fourth point. What you have got to remember always when you're there and engaging in Washington, that information home is critical. This is Australia's, or Washington is, Australia's information base. We have an enormously effective foreign affairs department, but it's very small. It's been made artificially large by its amalgamation now with the aid, what was the, the aid uh, agency. But it's still at the point that that occurred. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade that I entered was smaller than either the Department of Foreign Affairs or the Department of Trade when Bob Hawke amalgamated them in the 1980s. We have the representational and personnel level of the Republic of Slovenia. And uh, so there is a, uh, a shortage. Once you move aside from big embassies, there is a shortage of information. And the point about the United States is it's not the information on the United States that is super critical. It's the information everywhere else. So, for example, when the uprising broke out in Egypt, in Tahrir Square, we had a very good ambassador in Cairo, but she was completely consular. She and her one or two politicals were running all over the place, trying to find Australians and trying to make sure that they were safe. In that first week, we sent 42 cables from Washington about the situation in Egypt. I wrote three of them myself. And what we did was to acknowledge the fact that the United States was deeply connected in what you might describe as the Egyptian deep state. They knew all the generals. They knew all the bureaucrats. They knew all the, the, the uh, significant political folk, oppositional and government. They knew everybody. And what we need, and the think tanks were as well connected as, uh, as, the, uh, as the bureaucracy was. 
And we just went helter-skelter all around Washington, dragging every bit of information that we could out of every element of the system. I used to have a view that you did not need to send home a line. And I would write commentaries on a lot of the political officers' uh, cables back home. And they'd come to me worried after they saw my commentaries and say things like, you're not agreeing with what I've had to say. Well, I've never said, I don't agree with this, but they picked up a line. You're not agreeing, or you're saying something different from what I'm saying. Do you want me to alter it? And I said, no. Home is entitled to your judgment. You're an experienced political officer. And you have formed a view. So you should get that view back to Australia, even if I have, from the basis of people I've been talking to, a slightly different view. They'll make up their minds at home what they want to use. I also had an extraordinary experience of that tsunami uh, meltdown in Japan. Again, the importance of engaging to get information. Our Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, at the time, had sort of made a series of uh, uh, states that we did very helpful things. We were the first in with the C-17 American piece of kit. But we were the first in to, uh, uh, to take loads and built a superb reputation, or embellished a superb reputation in Japan on the basis of that. And Kevin was out there saying enormously portentous things about how we did not want to, in any way, shape or form, interfere with the processes in Japan because we were sure that the Japanese government had this absolutely under control. Uh, being the proficient and intelligent folk that they were, we were just there, be, there to be helpful. Well, the State Department called me in and said, Kim, we, we have a bit of a problem here. We have this awful feeling that your Prime Minister believes what he's saying. <laughs> <laughs> but you need to know that the Japanese don't have this under control at all. <laughs> Not at all. And we can't let you take this away but here is a piece of analysis that our people there have produced and sent home. You may sit in the corner and copy it out. <laughs> it contained a whole lot of mathematical equations. It was a, uh, it was a bit which I had absolutely no understanding of, and I was frightened beyond belief that I'd get a, a mark wrong in, uh, in sending those, uh, those equations home. But I copied it out laboriously, <coughs> sent it back, and got a rocket. Said, you are a panic merchant, a known panic merchant, and you've been talking to Campbell in the State Department, others also known panic merchants. This is a ridiculous position, proposition. You ought to go to the National Security Council tomorrow, and you ought to get the correct position. So I rang up the, uh, the relevant official in the... Uh, National Security Council and said, you know, I've got to talk to you about something a bit important. Said, Can it wait? <laughs> no, 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 uh, I do have to. I said, I'm running this Japanese thing. I said, no, I, I need to. Uh, so I went in and, uh, and told him uh, about it. He said, well, you have sent home wrong information. I said, oh, I said, the situation is much worse <laughs> than, uh, than has been indicated to you to this point. So I sent that home, but by then I think Australia had caught up. You now I thought home had learned. So I got a note from home saying that uh, the government was about to declare a 20 mile radius of, around the, the, the sites, encouraging Australians not to go into those areas. And I did say to PM's officer, do you think we might wait to see what the Americans do before we put that 20 miles out. No, don't be ridiculous. We've got to act immediately <laughs> and inform the Australians uh, in Tokyo about what they must do. So, uh, OK, OK. About a day later, I sent back to Canberra the American decision to ask their citizens to observe a radius of 50 miles. From, uh, and then got a rocket. Why didn't you tell us? <laughs> But anyway, that, that, that is the, that's the significance of, the, uh, of that, that area. But they also, you have to be alert to the fact that they will engage us where we don't want to be engaged. 
And the Americans don't get much credit for it, but they fought down that Ebola outbreak in, in Africa and mobilised folk to do it. We didn't actually really want to do much. We said we'd keep Ebola out of the Pacific. And um, they thought, well, that's nice, but we are actually trying to rally people to fix it where it is. And, um, and, and, and would you mind sort of getting into it? And, uh, and we did, you know, that's good to say. So that's some um, information there. And getting information is great, but it's always important to trade it to give them something. Now, we are better on Southeast Asia than they are, and therefore our discussions with them about Southeast Asia are immensely welcomed by them. We have an enormous reputation for being able to make good judgments about that area and you ought to take it in. You cannot afford to be a sponge with the Americans. I do remember one of our foreign ministers going in to see Susan Rice. And so I'm giving you all of this, but is there something that you could tell me? And it was genuine. It was not, uh, you know, it was fortunate that she had a few things. But, the, but it's advice that I always would give Prime Minister and others coming in, for God's sake, have something to say. For God's sake, have something that informs them about something they don't know much about. <coughs> China's very important in that regard. They are vastly more connected in China than we are. Vastly more. I know we sometimes think, well, we can stand between China and America and a system that their thought processes. It's simply ludicrous. The Americans, the Chinese, engage massively with the Americans. And, um, you know, senior Chinese officials holiday on the bush ranches. You have the uh, senior, uh, even think tankers, will be seen by senior ministers in China. Ministers that often we struggle to get meetings with for our ministers. The Chinese want to talk to the Americans all the time. There is a, there's of course out there in the American polity bitter arguments associated with China. There are different levels here. Inside this administration, others may be different, but the Bush administration is very similar. Inside this administration there's a consciousness of engaging China. The most important international meeting that occurs each year is the strategic and economic dialogue between China and the United States. At the last meeting in Washington, oh, actually there's been one since, since I was there, the last one I was there, the Chinese sent 400 officials to, uh, to participate in it. They don't need an interlocutor, the Americans. What they need is a news. You see, we're their only ally in East Asia that dispassionately ch discusses China with them. Those who are at least as capable as us, and probably better so, folk like the Japanese and even the South Koreans, they have an agenda. And if you have an agenda, you cannot be a muse. And uh, therefore, we are enormously valuable to them on that front, and that's part of our exchange. The fifth point is infused through the other points uh, that uh, I have been making. It is a security relationship that we have with the Americans and a deep one. Foreign policy can tease up error and disagreement, which, while inevitable, it is wise to manage it. A trusted great ally for a small power in an environment of increasing military complexity is not to be lightly flicked. Now, some regimes test that uh, more than others, and some administrations will test that more than others. But we have to be able to have with the Americans a security discussion with them in which they acknowledge the value of a commitment we make to their augmenting their military capability, uh, their capability to respond uh, to the the crises that they confront. Now what we're doing now, for example, in Iraq, which, uh, uh, this is another thing that I, I, I would say about my experience with it, because it's relevant when things may at the surface level become a little cracked or prickly. 
99% of what I did with the Americans, and much of it, it revolved around crises of major or minor sorts, never make it into the Australian media, never make it into an Australian political discussion. The world that I lived in for six years is not the world that we live in daily here in, uh, or in the, America, in the United States either, in the discourse that we have between us. The, uh, what we often see as a, an absolutely vital argument about sovereignty or something else is just not actually relevant to the character of the exchange that, uh, that we have with them. Other things are relevant. And uh, those, um, uh, you know, and it's important that those other things get engaged. And I did find that both defence and foreign ministers from Australia had often had lots for us to do in relation to the United States, and they were dealing with the same problems, problems that they were not discussing uh, with the general public. But you have to keep home to be able to have that discussion. You have to keep a constant stream of, of, of engagement with your own people who are embedded in the American system and those who uh, you've come to, to trust. The final point is that, to coin a phrase of somebody else's, it's the economy, stupid. <laughs> Our economic relationship moves to a slightly different dynamic. Uh, for example, the Trans-Pacific Partnership has its strategic component, but there are different views on that, whether it's wise or unwise. The, uh, uh, and some in the administration do see the TPP only in terms of containment of China, but neither we nor this administration looks at it that way. We see it as setting the standards of good governance and prosperity in the Asian region, good governance particularly, so that trade doesn't develop in a haphazard way that, that is, it will develop in a haphazard way, but there is an opportunity for a serious economic exchange, uh, both in services as well as goods, and in the principles that underpin uh, the, the way in which that trade is conducted. Having said that we share a view on that, we have also been in bitter disagreement in the debates around the TPP. And the character of the relationship more broadly that I've been describing has a little different character when it comes to the, the trade area, as Andrea Gleeson, who is here, will be able to tell you as she has been involved over the years, or was involved when I was there, in a lot of those fights. Not just about TPP, but about other things. And sometimes, it's almost invariably going to be here, we have a breach. And for us, the breach was membership of the, Australian, the uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. The United States desperately did not want us to go into the bank. And we felt that we should. And the uh, position that, well, when I say you know, it's the NSC desperately did not want us to go into that bank. And uh, we took the view that uh, we would. Um, I told the Americans, said, you, you've got to understand that there is a way, there is a different way we look at China and Australia from the way in which you do. You look at China from an east-west perspective. You look at it essentially through your direct interactions with Confucian-type societies. So you have a particular perspective that that generates. We look north-south. We look at it through Southeast Asia. The Southeast Asians are immensely important to us. They're not Confucian societies outside Vietnam. And they have a different view about how they ought to interact. And they are desperately anxious to have the Australians in this bank so that there will be somebody who can make a stand for good governance, which they know that they can't make themselves. And therefore they are telling us that they want us 
uh, to be engaged and we have to take them seriously and we will. However, what we will do is this. We will not do anything that you are not informed of in advance. It won't necessarily mean that we will um, obviously do what you want, but you will know what we're going to do. Now, there, was, there were some in the administration, obviously, who took a very different view. Treasury was no, by no means as, as, uh, as hostile uh, to the development of the bank as, uh, as some other parts of the administration were. And over time, they began to form the view that perhaps we were right in this and that perhaps um, we were actually doing something useful as the Chinese adjusted the rules associated with the bank pretty well all the way in the direction which we had been promoting and had advised the Americans uh, in advance. So there's a, the economy side uh, produces often quite a different outlook. Another facet of that outlook is that all our investment is going to the United States. Uh, now, this is something that Australians don't really comprehend. But the mutual investment between Australia and the United States now is the best part of 1.3 trillion, 1.4. About 800 billion US into Australia, which is still about um, 8 to 10 times the Chinese level of investment in Australia. And half of it certainly isn't in real estate, which is pretty well where the Chinese investment is at the moment. And ours into the United States is over 500 billion now and increasing at about 20 or 30 billion a year. We have the fourth largest sum of money under management globally. And uh, we, courtesy of our superannuation arrangements, which we're always seem to be trying to track. And, uh, the, and most of our investment in the United States is portfolio investment associated with that. So, um, but that teases up a lot of interest in Australian superannuation funds in the US, but increasingly it is direct investment. And over the United States, but mainly on the West Coast, but developing now in Texas, developing now in North Carolina, developing now in Boston, and bits and pieces just about everywhere. Australian firms are setting up inside the United States. About 10,000 Australian firms do business in the United States and now close to 1,000 are doing production in the United States. And we are going to be a nation in the future of niche producers of goods and supply chain producers of goods and producers of services. And operating in the United States you get total protection for your investment. You get an economy of scale and you get total protection. So one of the cases that was on in the Supreme Court via the Texas Supreme Court when I got there was the Americans had pinched Wi-Fi. An American firm had pinched Wi-Fi, uh, which was an Australian invention, the CSIRO. And uh, the Australian uh, uh, owners of the patent sued the company in the US Supreme Court, or ultimately in the US Supreme Court. The Australians won, we won 9 nil in the US Supreme Court. Name another country in the world where that would happen on a, uh, on a piece of Australian intellectual property. But that's, that's the point. Our money is going there because it is safe. We need it to go other places as well. And it is going other places as well. But overwhelmingly, it, uh, it is going there. So, um, I guess the, the final group that I'd want to talk about, and I've only, I'm only really five minutes over the 40 minutes I was allowed, um, was uh, Congress, which is a whole different story. The thing that you have to recognise is you separately engage Congress in the United States. And we have a group in the embassy explicitly directed towards doing that. And one of the few advantages I brought to the job was being part of the 
representative Freemasonry that uh, enables you to have reasonable access to congressmen. Congressmen, you absolutely have to have something useful to them when you're going to see them. About 60% of a congressman's day, or a member of the House's day, not necessarily a senator, is spent raising money. I mean that literally. 60% is spent raising money or political organisation. It's that hard with an election every two years and every man for himself or herself in the, uh, in the American political system. Political parties are not so important to the campaign as what you actually do for yourself once you have the party ticket. And uh, we have neither money nor votes for them. And if you have neither money nor votes, you're a waste of time for a congressman usually. So you have to go in there and to build a relationship based on having something to say. So one of the efforts that we were making very strongly when I left was with that small section of the Democratic Party who were deviating from the party line to support the TPP. TPP, if it does go through, and there is, uh, that's a real hard ask, and one would have to say certainly wouldn't if Trump is president, um, needs to get about 30 or 40 Democrat votes uh, to overcome the vicissitudes of the Freedom Caucus who will vote against it, because they'll vote against anything that Obama puts up. But the... Um, and they need a lot of encouragement because they're under a huge threat in their primaries and their constituencies. So I used to, I used to go out and debate union officials in the uh, in one instance in the um, for a congressman who felt that I could do it better, and um, the uh, and and uh, keep them encouraged and on board for for, uh, for for being supportive of it. But that was just one aspect. I found it useful to go to the C Street Commune. Now, the C, C Street House is an interesting phenomenon. It's a, it's a group of Christian congressmen who live together and who uh, have a, um, a, a meal every, a uh, common meal every Tuesday night. And I used to try to get to as many of those as they could. Mostly, they are right wing Republicans but they were some Democrats as well. And the interesting, you, you could get points through, but you'd have to get them through subtly, because they did not discuss politics. Well, not much anyway. The only politics they'd discuss would be the sort of personal politics. Who's up, who's down, what does so-and-so did on what committee, or something like that. And discuss issues. But they cared for each other. So the thing that you have to remember when you're there is the United States is a Christian country, and we are not. So we don't know what a Christian country is like. Uh, the United States is Christian, with uh, around about 60% uh, regularly attending, uh, well, the definition of regularity, attending services. And that's enormously important to them. And, uh, and it's also important to them that they behave as Christians to other people in trouble. So this group would be helping out members of uh, Congress who had personal problems of, uh, of various varieties. And not judgmental. They tended to be, and most of these guys are evangelicals, they tended to be uh, strongly oriented to just problem solving as opposed to, to judgment. But getting into the Congress, so much of what the President has to do has to go through Congress. Getting an understanding of how they're reacting is also important in sending things home, but also vital often in getting through what you think is significant on Australia's behalf. So, I, I, I am now, I think, pretty expert on the Obama administration. If Hillary Clinton is elected, a lot of what I've had to say to you will probably carry through and be manifest, albeit with developments, in much the way I'm talking about. Trump is elected, it will be destroyed. And um, what will emerge, one doesn't know. But, uh, you know, the, one doesn't need to be abusive of Trump, one simply needs to point out uh, that the policies that he puts forward for interaction with our region will destroy the American position. 
in that region. Our position is fragile, their position is fragile, and it's enormously dependent on an empathetic interaction, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia. Trump has absolutely no focus on that, apart from killing the TPP. That's the only thing he's had to say significantly about Southeast Asia. It's broader than Southeast Asia, of course. It's the other side of the Pacific as well, and North, but its most important feature is what it will do to trade in the, in the Southeast Asian region. So that's, a, uh, so that's something that we'll have to watch out for. This is something that uh, Joe Hockey will have to handle as it works its way through by their relationship with the US and, and their relationship uh, with the region. Uh, if he pushes further with the Japanese and the South Koreans, with the positions he's been adopting towards them, there could conceivably be quite, over time, quite a substantial strategic change in the region as well. Now, a lot of people would say that, uh, and this does happen, that American presidents, once they change, they gather around them people of considerable expertise. All that is true. Uh, I remember certainly dealing with fears that were there of the Reagan administration when they came in. Reagan produced a brilliant bunch of cabinet ministers who effectively ran most of the relationship in the region around us very well. And, uh, and so that was, that was fine. I just don't see in the personality of uh, the fellow anything that remotely approaches a capacity to think like that. And uh, therefore, you know, we will have to be prepared if this is to occur for a, a very different environment in which to operate. Now, I think it's always right to say that the, who the Americans elect as president is their business as we, who we elect the government, is ours. And for us to assume that we have the right to uh, have a, um, a say on that election is uh, outside that framework, as it would be furious, we would be furious if one of them rang up and said that they wanted Malcolm Turnbull elected or Bill Shorten elected or whatever. The that having been said, I go to the second point that I've been making through that, all of this, all of these remarks. You have at the back of your mind your own country's interests. And you have at the back of your mind your own country's views, which are not necessarily the same thing. And your job, if you're an ambassador, is to make absolutely certain the Americans don't miss the point on any of that. And if you do not like the direction that they're going, on a particular matter, you say it. I, uh, I do remember, and I'll finish with this, I do remember when I first got there, Kevin Rudd had a, a proposal for an Asian Pacific community. And uh, as soon as I managed to get out of hospital and still in a wheelchair, uh, I, got, I was the object of a full court press uh, by the East Asian section of the State Department who sat down and said, you have got to tell your government at home to back off this. Said, You're looking ridiculous. Nobody in the region agrees with you. The propositions that you're putting forward are extremely unhelpful. This is before the announcements on pivots and things. And uh, that, uh, that's been a... Uh, this is something that, uh, in which you're not helping the United States. My response to that was, uh, you haven't the first idea of what we're doing. So we understand absolutely that the propositions that we put out there are not going to be adopted. They're there for a discussion on the character of the region. And the most important point that we are making is that you ought to be in it. We are trying to get in place an environment in which you join major institutions, which in this case we think is the East Asian Summit. And we think you need to make the adjustments in your policies uh, towards dealing with ASEAN, whose priorities are the focal point of the East Asian supplement. And half of what we are about is you. And you are a very ungrateful bunch. <laughs> and uh, you, ought to be, you ought to be looking very carefully 
at the things that uh, the things that we are doing, which they did. I'm not saying that that was terribly influential, but uh, I got after the, Obama finished that particular debate inside the administration on joining the EAS uh, with a, what you might call a moot, in which he, and he does this often. He set up a debate. Hillary Clinton was going to go two or three days after that to the ASEAN Regional Forum, where it was possible that membership of the East Asian Summit would be discussed. She had already signed the Treaty of Amity, which gave them a, a ticket, if you like, to a, a, a broader discussion. USTR, trade, the uh, economic section of the National Security Council, and the Treasury were, and, the, and more importantly, uh, the um, White House schedulers were absolutely opposed to the Americans joining the East Asian Sun. Supporting it was the uh, relevant regional section of the National Security Council and the State Department. So it's basically Hillary was there, Kirk Campbell was there, uh, and uh, then you had um, uh, Froman, Geithner and uh, others on the other side of the argument. Apparently it went to and fro, and um, uh, in the end, Obama decided for Hillary and decided they would do the rebalance, send her off, go and do the East Asian Summit. Now, we were pretty pleased when all that happened. So I got this note from home saying uh, I should go in and get a history of why the Americans took the decision that they did. It's one of the weirder briefing requirements. So I went to see Jeff Bader, who was then the senior director for East Asia, and a much more influential person in the Obama administration than somebody holding the position of senior director than we would be. And I said, look, uh, Home wants an essay from me on the subject of how you um, came to make the decision that you did to join us. He said, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, and I said, no, no. He said, well, it's all about you. <laughs> of course, he didn't mean it, but that was nice. <laughs> you mean it straight. Um, so, so that is uh, engaging Washington, and thanks so much for coming out for it. Um, do you reckon a couple of questions? No. So Sue's shut you down. So, <laughs> Kim, I, on behalf of everybody here, I, I can only thank you enormously for your frank and insightful and knowledgeable um, lecture you've given us this evening, oration. It's very rare that you get the view from the inside of our most important embassy, and undoubtedly Washington is, and your time there was an important time, and we are very lucky that you were there at this time, but we're also very lucky that you're here now. <laughs> and we're delighted to welcome you back to Perth. Um, now, the Institute of International Affairs has a particular honour that it gives people who excel uh, in the international relations area. And every year, um, the Institute uh, uh, awards two or three or four uh, fellowships. And it decided, before Kim accepted to become the national president, they decided that he was one of those people who should be recognized as a fellow. And it's as well they did that because we have a rule that you can't give fellowships to people who are office bearers of the, of the organization. <laughs> so he's not getting it because he's our national president. We're delighted, Kim, you are our national president. Um, but I'm going to give you your um, wonderful uh, extra bit of glass to add to your collection <laughs> in recognition of this fellowship. Congratulate you. Um, uh, one of the conditions of our fellows, we ask them, they have to give a fellowship lecture. Well, Kim, I think you've done that this evening. Oh, Thank you. <laughs>